okay so we are recording the chat now so let just me repeat for the recording um, today's week uh, is for uh, actually starting to uh, work with javascript uh, we had the first two weeks with the uh, videos about the basic types the last one was about uh, uh, arrays and uh, er sorry objects and functions that are the core uh, uh, that will actually grow very much during uh, when we start to move to all the more difficult things uh, so I, I i don't have any say additional uh, uh, say topic to, to to tell you to explain you now so i'm open for your question Questions that maybe uh, either on the uh, uh, say uh, organization of the course, uh, we are still in the first week, so we can fix uh, uh, whatever uh, is needed, and uh, on the topics of course uh, that were in the videos and so on. Maybe if you have some question which is more specific to the lab, uh, it's better maybe to uh, to to wait until tomorrow. Uh, so that uh, uh, during the, the the hours that are fixed for the lab, uh, um, so that uh, every everybody can benefit, so we can uh, focus on on the code for the solution of the of, the, of lab num number one. But if you have more general questions or uh, on any other issues, uh, um, you can start uh, uh, telling me. Uh, just one <laughs> one comment uh, before I shut up uh, is uh, uh, we created the Slack workspace uh you, all of you actually joined very quickly but i saw very little traffic uh, on slack so don't be shy <laughs> we have the tool for communicating use it so don't if even if you are asking stupid questions about uh, uh when is the class or uh, how do you install that or, or this uh, uh it's better that we, if we can share the the, the problems and the solutions uh, we have the tool let's use it it's not just a, an official communication tool for the teachers to give you information but it should be also i i hope it should be also a discussion tool uh, for for everybody okay as i promised i shut up um, so i i am taking your question i see the first question the chat is asking whether uh, you should deliver the labs after finishing uh, no, thanks. <laughs> no, uh, we don't uh, ask you to submit anything. Uh, so the labs are, are for you uh, to learn and to, to experiment. Uh, so we are not correcting them. We are not grading them in any way. So they're, they're, uh, that part of your, of your learning path, uh, we, they are not part of the, of the exam or, or of the evaluation. Of course, you can uh, submit uh, your solution if you have any problems, any questions, uh, and so we want us to look at what you wrote, then you're welcome to do that uh, and we will uh, uh, have a look and give you feedback. But uh, in general, you don't have to submit anything, okay? Uh, my idea is that uh, uh, it's better if you spend, try to spend time uh, in, uh, in understanding an exercise and try to solve it yourself rather than trying at the last minute to, to to grab and copy from a friend uh, another solution so that you can meet the deadline for submitting. So I'm, I'm not for submitting anything. You're not required to do that. Can you upload the videos earlier? It's possible with a video chat. Uh, it's a good question. Mm, I, I'm. What I can tell you that we are really rushing in order to, to keep up with the pace of this course. It's very hard. Uh, it's, it's my problem, not your problem, but uh, I have two courses in this moment. So I'm one course at the beginning of the week and the other at the end. And so I'm trying to publish videos for, for both of them. And uh, it's really hard for us to, to, to work uh, with Meta Advanced. Uh, the one thing that uh, we should uh, understand that we are still trying to recover for the first week that was lost. So in the in these first two three weeks, uh, we'll have to uh, add more material than what is normally expected for one week's uh, worth of work. Um, so uh, I hope that w once we get the pace, once we get the, the starting material uh, settled up, uh, we could uh, a, a bit uh, say decrease the rhythm in which we are publishing new new classes and so it would be also easier for you to uh, to to follow them in time 
So uh, I, I tr I'll try my best. This is the only thing that I can do. I, I can promise actually uh, to, to be able to, to anticipate much more. Uh, but uh, we'll try to do that. Uh, this is the only issue that uh, I, we didn't want uh, to, to, to delay the beginning of the labs. So we wanted still to start the labs tomorrow and not shift it to the third week. Because originally the lab was planned in the week number three of the course. Okay? And this is week number three, really, <laughs> but we lost number one. Uh, we, we discussed whether to move the lab uh, to the 27th, to next Friday, but then uh, I, I wouldn't shrink too much the lab activity. So uh, we, we decided to compress a bit the classes, the lectures, uh, in order to start the lab now. So it's a bit uh, uh, say, uh, a rush for us to, to recover this week. We hope it will get better. Um, okay, then... Uh, okay, the next question is, uh, we didn't use classes. Uh, is it because we are only to use uh, going to use closures? Uh, no, we will also see the classes, uh, how they work in JavaScript. Uh, um, but uh, well, the fact is that JavaScript is a very rich language. Maybe also complex, but for sure it's very rich. And so there are many ways of doing the same thing. Uh, working directly with objects, uh, closing objects, uh, immediately executed functions, and so on, and also classes. Classes are, are and, and also modules. These are that are another way uh, of packing information uh, at, at the high level. And also, we have two different types of modules: the common JS modules and the ES6 modules. We'll see them. Uh, um, there is not a right way of doing everything. So what we must do, in my opinion, is to get familiar with the most important patterns of programming and, uh, and then use them when we, when we need them. So, of course, we will see classes later, but uh, as we will understand, classes as, are basically a shortcut for uh, constructor, fu constructor functions. So just a syntax shortcut, shortcut but the real meaning uh, is, um, is the same. So we first get familiar with the basic mechanism of uh, of creating objects and uh, uh, interacting between objects and functions, and then we'll see the, the syntax sugar, which is uh, uh, the, the class uh, construct. That will help us, of course, uh, in doing something, but in many other cases, uh, uh, what we see that in many libraries, of course, you have a lot of classes defined, uh, but for your day-to-day -day code, uh, you don't need to define classes. So we first need to work with objects, and then we'll learn classes so we, we will do both okay um, this is the spirit that we are trying to give is that to, to try to understand not all the language it's very complex but uh, it's very wide but um, the, the core issue the core let's say constructs that uh, we want uh, to understand them, them very well then for example when we see uh, when we develop with the react uh, with a framework or any other framework every framework has their own preferences or their own styles so, for example, in React, they are saying, okay, for creating a component, use a function. And then the next version said, okay, for creating a component, it's better to use a class. And then last year, they came out with hooks and say, well, don't use classes anymore, but use uh, functions with hooks. So there's a preferences or sort of style that changes over time. But as long as we know the, the basics uh, and we can manage them, we, are, we will be very fine in switching from one syntax to another. Um, okay, in any case, even if you are using classes, closures still apply because a, a method that uses a, a property of a class is actually is really inside using the closure of the functional method over the variables declared or the properties declared in the class. So actually it's a, uh, the same thing with a different syntax. Uh, HTTP, a question from by Ricardo. Uh, which version will be will we use uh, in HTTP? Do you think that version 3.0 will spread quickly enough to become universally used? Uh, I, um, two questions, one easy and, uh, and the other is uh, less easy. The easy one is which version we will use. Uh, uh, we don't care, <laughs> basically. Uh, so what's happening is that uh, for the kind of um, uh, of application that we are going to, to develop, uh, uh, even version 1.1 will be more than enough. Uh, the, and the, the, the programming that we'll do, the kind of programming, uh, is, will be entirely based on, uh, say, um, 
HTTP callbacks. So the, the front end um, code will speak to the back end code using HTTP calls. And uh, uh, for the kind of APIs, uh, we don't need any special features uh, that HTTP2 is providing. So we don't need the extra complexity because we don't need streaming, we don't need server push and so on. This is something that you may be, uh, will work uh, uh, in the next courses, in the second course with distributed system programming. So uh, right now, uh, usually you can use uh, HTTP 1.1, it's more than enough. It's not worth making it more complex, uh, especially for, because, the, the the application code on the front end doesn't uh, uh, is not very much influenced by the kind of protocol uh, for the type of uh, application that we are developing. Uh, HTTP two is uh, right now in use in many many say high volume servers. Uh, they are still already using that. It's uh, supported by all the browsers and it's implemented by the major servers. Um, but uh, it's not uh, it's not an issue that uh, will impact the front end development which is the the focus of this course whether http3 will spread quickly uh, i really don't know so this is the, the difficult part of the question uh, predicting the future is not uh, uh, is not my my major skill um mm, what I can imagine is that there will not be a universal solution. I, I will see the coexistence of different protocols and every maybe function, every server, any application will use one protocol or another depending on their needs. I don't see why uh, you know, a small appliance in your home should use the complexity of HTTP 3.0 if it's only going to deliver, I don't know, the temperature reading in your home once every 30 minutes to a server. So HTTP one is more than win, more than enough for that, uh, and you don't need to distribute certificates and make streamings and so and get persistent connections and all the stuff uh, uh, for uh, simple things. So uh, I'm not good at, at, at foreseeing the future, but with the kind of future I will so foresee, I, I, I would foresee is that uh, different protocols will will exist together. HTTP three, by the way, is uh, one. Uh, uh, more recent proposal from one commercial company that was standardized and then it depends also if the other there's also marketing issues among the companies whether they want to adopt a solution that was developed by another one um, and okay there is a suggestion or a request from uh, Enrico uh, that says that uh, he would prefer uh, to have live lessons uh, in the video chat instead of uh, uh, having the videos. Um, I, I remember that last time we asked, I asked this question and uh, 99, if not 100% uh, of people say that they preferred videos uh, instead of live uh, classes. Uh, and so that is what the, 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 the the method we are using. Um, maybe, okay, I take it as a second strong suggestion to publish the lectures earlier. Okay, so we'll try uh, to make uh, more, have more distance between uh, the, the lectures and the chat. So we have the chat and the lab on Thursday and Friday. And so we'll try to publish the, the, the lectures at the beginning of the week so that you, can, you may have uh, uh, some more time uh, so that you can uh, see the lectures and have some more as a useful this we can we may have some more useful discussions here okay so i i get in that will we write html pages of course we will so the next step after the web architecture so the next uh, lecture uh, following the, the initial introduction about web architecture will, will be the structure of web pages so HTML, CSS, and so on. Uh, so we are, you see, we are approaching uh, from two sides, uh, uh, front-end application. From one side, the JavaScript language, and from the other side, uh, the browser, uh, the content that are displayed on the browser, uh, HTML, static sheets, uh, CSS, and the DOM, and so on. And then they will meet actually at the DOM uh, when JavaScript will start interacting with the web page. So right now we are on parallel tracks. Uh, we are, we had a, 
quick class about uh, uh, the architecture of the web and we are having classes about the JavaScript language, but they will converge in week number four or five when we start developing on the browser and not just uh, simple programs on the server. Um, uh, what is the difference between model two and model three? Slide six, seven. Let me get. Let me pick the the, the slides because I. You are pointing to slide seventy six of uh, web architecture. So uh, browser web architecture sixty seven. Yeah, okay, so it's this slide, I, I'm sharing it. Uh, I'm sharing it, it's like, where's the control? Yeah, share screen, this one. So the question was about this slide. And uh, um, what is the question was, what's the difference between this solution, the intermediate one, and the right one? Um, we will uh, follow this path actually. So we'll start creating uh, application with this method where we have uh, a user interface and some JavaScript which interacts and empowers, gives uh, more say, interactivity to the user interface. And whenever it needs uh, uh, to interact with the server, uh, of course you can call it. The difference between these two is that uh, um, in the second model, we have a website which is mostly generated on the server side. So the server will generate the page, the HTML, the widgets, uh, uh, the content and so on. Uh, and then we'll send uh, to uh, the user interface, uh, the whole page or UI fragments. So UI fragment means fragments of a page. So the server will generate maybe the HTML code for a portion of the page. It will send it to the browser and the browser will display it in a box, for example, uh, somewhere. So the server will be responsible for generating most of the interface uh, and the JavaScript code on the, on the front end will just, uh, let's say, make it dynamic mm, and ask for the server for the new data, for the updates and so on. Um, and so there will be the, the logic of the application. Most of the logic will still be on the server. Why in the third level, uh, the server is just uh, an API provider, a service provider. We only provide data and all the logics of the navigation of the application, moving from page to page, uh, uh, deciding, uh, so controlling user actions, uh, validations, and so on, are all in the in the front-end development. So this is much similar to when you're developing a standalone program, like maybe a graphical program in, in Java or in C Sharp or whatever. So there is your program, the program will do everything from caring about the user interface to caring about the data validation and so on. And uh, when it needs, uh, it can contact an, a remote service where the data are stored. So basically, the server will become data storage uh, and uh, it will expose some, some methods uh, uh, through the HTTP API. We call them, uh, usually we will use the REST uh, pa uh, programming pattern for developing these APIs. Uh, and uh, the server will not be involved in the user interface will not be involved in a graphical generation of elements on the page will not be involved in uh, uh, in interacting with the user everything will be done here so uh, when we are developing with a front end framework like react we will be in this in this solution uh, there are some simpler frameworks but at that point you need to do some sort of a programming on the client for some functions and some programming on the server from a, for other functions and uh, from the architectural point of view, it's simpler because the web server still does the same job as we did in the past. But from the programming point of view, it becomes more complex because then you have to, in your mind, to keep in mind what the client is doing, what the server is doing, and then uh, integrate their, uh, their behavior. So when they started to have more powerful web browsers, they moved quickly on the uh, on this side. Uh, if you want to, we have an example. Uh, if you are building um, an autocomplete feature, for example, for your browser, 
for your text box, uh, this architecture is more than enough because you already have a web page, you may create, create it statically, and then you, you need to add, add a bit of dynamic behavior into some part of the page. So, but the most of the page and most of the application will run on the server. If you are building, I don't know, Gmail, then a lot of, um, say, uh, user interface and user interaction and so on will happen on the browser and the server will only be called when we need some information about what are your contacts, what are the new messages, and so on. Uh, but uh, as we say, we will start, uh, uh, say, with uh, during the, the labs, uh, with, uh, at one point we will write one kind of application like this, and then we will move uh, to something more complex in this, uh, in this domain. So in uh, sorry in yeah. uh, model three, the server doesn't generate an HTML file anymore. Uh, it will, uh, but you will only always provide a very simple one, so a nearly empty one usually, or uh, a very simple one. So it's not. Uh, uh, of course, uh, everything should be contained in a, in an HTML file. But uh, for example, if if you're curious, just uh, try to to visit uh, Twitter. Twitter is very instructive because in, in the first HTML it, it downloads when you open the, the home page and you see in the, in the inspector, it's practically empty. And all everything, and then it it loads all the JavaScript and the JavaScript will load everything else. So the, the, the difference is that uh, the control over what gets into the page <clears throat> is uh, uh, on the front end. Uh, HTML, uh, there will, it's ne oh, we need to have a starting page in HTML, but it may be a simple one, it's not very, with uh, um, I say not much logic behind that, it's just a container. And then the control goes to the front end JavaScript, and the front end JavaScript will uh, load the data, and from this data, we'll build the components. Mm -hmm. uh, we will see in React that we are creating HTML fragments on the client, on the browser inside the React application that runs in the browser. So we will write HTML, but the HTML we will write it will not be in the web server application, it will be in the JavaScript front end. It's a bit strange, but uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I lost the chat because whenever we change something, okay. What's the difference, Mustafa, uh, between using this uh, inside the function expression and function declaration and using this in this global context? Uh, uh, I'm not answering this right now because uh, the usage of, of, of this is very, very complicated. Uh, it follows uh, several strange rules uh, and depending on whether uh, the meaning of this, um, you know, if you are coming from, uh, from Java, it's very clear. Uh, we have a class, and this is, can be used inside the method of the class and refer to the specific object instances. That's it. In JavaScript, it's more, it's more complex. Uh, it, and it depends on how you define the function. So it will behave differently in uh, function expressions compared to arrow functions. It will behave different, uh, differently depending on how you call the function with a dot syntax, uh, with, a, with a reference, and so on. And it will also depend, we will change behavior uh, according to the strict mode or not using the strict mode. And so, for example, in strict mode, uh, using this in the global context is forbidden. You cannot use it in, uh, in a global context. You cannot use it in classical function definitions, in, in function defined in a classical way. In strict mode, you can only, only use this in a, um, function expression and arrow functions. And it will behave differently in the two cases. So in one case, just to give a short answer, in one case, it uh, will uh, point to the current function uh, and uh, in the case of a uh, function expression and uh, in, uh, in the case of arrow function, this will refer to the surrounding context. So we'll close over the this of the container. But it's a complex stuff and we'll need to, to discuss it with in detail when, uh, when we start working with uh, asynchronous callbacks, when it's important that the function will have a reference to the context in which it was called. So it's a topic that we will discuss, but it's more complex than uh, the knowledge that we have at the moment. It's one of the, uh, the rules for it is feel, uh, just, there's a simple rules to fill two pages. 
but uh, uh, of course we'll try to have a look at the rules uh, but mostly try to have a look of the how to use it normally so what are the, the suggestions and this will be one detail where the function expression and arrow function will behave differently so right up to now in the in the video he said okay they are more or less equivalent there are this different syntaxes for doing the same thing so defining a function uh, when we come to this uh, they will dif differ so uh, so just have some patience and uh, one or more two weeks uh, we'll uh, also dig into that detail um, how will the react source be served to the client in the exam uh, asks alexi we will use some packager uh, well um, yes it's a bit early for this question but uh, the answer is of course uh, we will use the uh, create a react, a react application script uh, that will package all the code that we that we need um, and uh, uh, we will use uh, uh, we will start using a very simple uh, javascript server like express.js to serve uh, this package uh, um, oh, well let's say for development we use the internal web server of uh, that was generated the, 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 uh, directly by by react because it's uh, it does all the uh, automatic uh, uh, say reloading and so on. So it's very very um, say, uh, easy to use for the, this purpose. But when we move to more complex application, we'll have a, a very a small instance of a, a React web server uh, with, sorry, uh, <laughs> of a node uh, with an Express.js web server and will serve all the packages that were created by, uh, by the creator attack React after that will also package all, all its files. So there's a, um, basically, basically, we have two servers running, one for the React application and one for the HTTP call. Um, I, I don't know how much time we will have to, to dig uh, under all the possibilities, packages and tools for packing JavaScript application. So there are many alternatives uh, and uh, it's more of a, of a, uh, a server-side things, how, how to serve and pack stuff. Uh, and it's more of a... Uh, a not issue so how node.js will be we, we have we love, we won't have much time to uh, study all the features of node.js and npm because we want to run mostly on the on the browser i have only six credits to go and there's a lot of uh, topics to to manage so we will see a practical solution how to do that and how to so to to create the application to de to deploy it uh, but uh, there will be more to to, to study to understand the alternatives uh, Claudio told me, supposing you have an array of, of objects, uh, is there a way for creating another array with one specific attribute of those objects without using a loop? Uh, yes. Uh, for example, with the, um, with the functional programming methods, uh, you can do that. Uh, you can iterate over an array with a for each method, uh, and uh, it will construct an array element by element where you can modify that. So uh, we still didn't have them in the slide. It will be another topic for the, the next classes of JavaScript. It will be about uh, functional programming. So all the method to functionally access and modify uh, data structures, in particular arrays, and about uh, asynchronous functions. So dig deeper in the callback uh, stuff uh, when, when the asynchronous functions come into play. So uh, the, um, the answer to Claudio uh, answer is, uh, uh, the question is yes, if you want to start having a look at the functional methods in, in the array objects. So there is uh, for each method, for example, there are filters, there are maps, there are, uh, um, let's say, reduce methods and so on. Uh, and we'll study that in the, in, the next, in the next class, actually. And so that we will uh, be able to uh, modify, let's say, modify the content of, the, of an array or create a new array. Um, by using the functional approach, uh, iterating with a functional call and uh, uh, giving the callback function that only does the specific, the specific modification that we did. Right now in the lag tomorrow, you will have something with, for, with sorting and filtering, which are the easy ways, but uh, there's a, a full, uh, full spectrum of functional um, say primitive to do what you are, what you are working to do. Um, then, uh, OK, Ricardo, I have a simple question, JavaScript function. Is it the capital letter that makes a function a constructor? Is there any difference in a constructor with new and a function that constructs the object and returns it? 
okay no the capital letter is just a convention uh, usually we mark a, a constructor function with a capital letter but it's not required by the syntax okay it's easier to, to read but it's not uh, required it doesn't change the meaning um, a constructor function uh, is characterized by the fact that it's called with new and so uh, it will uh, create a new object and then assign attributes to it okay so the the new operator before the call will actually create the object and will pass the new object an empty new object to the to the constructor function that we that, that is then responsible to fill it if you want you can create the object inside the function so in the first element you may say my object equal uh, open and close embrace fill this object and return this object is the same but just in the second case you will not call the function with new uh, you, you would just call the function so uh, it's a pattern and the second one that you are suggesting more similar to um, factory functions a factory in the program, um, programming patterns is a, a function that creates objects so you can create objects uh, with a constructor and so you use the new that gives you the new object or you just call a function that inside it will create a, a new object uh, with a, the code and uh, uh, and then return that new object is the same there are two different methods and at the end the object that is created is the same so at the same characteristic so after you the object is available there's no difference uh, on how you created one of the others we should not make confusion because uh, as we maybe you saw that in the if you already saw that the, the part of the lectures on the dates uh, date uh, can be used both as a function as a constructor function and as a function is only able to return the current date and the constructor function is can be parsed any kind of date so mm, it's up to us to call the function in the correct way mm. um, so the difference the, there is the difference in the function there's the difference in how you call it there is no difference in the kind of objects that is constructed it's up to you how do you prefer uh, to, to use that uh, by the way, the new keyword will also be used with classes. So there will be some, again, many ways of doing the same thing with similar syntaxes. Uh, the application of uh, IAFE in the real world, uh, is it possible to pass parameter into it like other regular functions? Uh, okay, so uh, it's, a, it's a strange pattern um, that is basically used, uh, well, uh, to isolate some code from the rest of the of your module so um, it was very used uh, um, before the modular approaches came into play so right now if you want to isolate some code and not make it accessible from the other code in your application you create a module okay we'll see what modules uh, are and how to create them uh, shortly and uh, uh, and so you pack everything into a module later on also we can create uh, classes for doing the same thing uh, for having uh, an isolation a container before that uh, the only mechanism to isolate some scope the scope of some variables was uh, to put them into a function and so you created functions just for the purpose of isolating some variables so that these variables will disappear at the end of the function and then that function is only needed once because you I really didn't need a, a real function. You just needed a way to, to scope away some part of the variable, some part of your resources. And so uh, you do define the function and you call that immediately. So this is a basic mechanism uh, of the language the, of isolating scope, uh, executing some code and throwing away everything uh, that has not been, say, kept alive by a closure. Uh, and this under the hood is still the mechanism that the uh, um, say modules are using so when you define a module with the we import a module with require actually under the hood a node is uh, doing this you are it's executing um, all the model in the context of a function and will execute that function uh, you can pass some parameters but it would be strange because of the um, First of all, the IAFE are functions that cannot be reused. 
because you define the function, you call it, but you don't save a reference to the function anywhere. So you cannot check, you will not be able to call it a second time. Uh, it's just just one one shot. Um, the, it's, so it's not I'm, I'm merging the the answer uh, with uh, Lorenzo that asked me about is it a way of creating a singleton pattern? No, a singleton pattern uh, allows me to call many time many times a method for creating an object, and every time it will return the same object. But in a singleton singleton sorry, you can use it many times. You can call it many times. With an IFE, only, you can only call it once, okay? You cannot call it a second time. If you were to execute the same IFE a second time, it will create a new object. So it, not, it will not be collapsed into the same instance as, as with a single time. Um, so it's not for that purpose. Um, so uh, I, we were on to parameters. Uh, you can define parameters. Uh, Yes, it doesn't make much sense because the function is called only once, so it will be something more complex. And also, uh, you are defining a parameter whose value would be a variable in the context where the IFE is defined. And, but it's not needed because uh, the IFE can just access the variables in the surrounding context, can use them directly. Huh? So uh, defining a parameter and passing it seems like just extra work for nothing because that function cannot be reused anywhere else and the access to the variable that, are, that you are passing is, always, is already granted because you can access the surrounding context. So usually, in theory, yes, you can. In practice, nobody needs to do that. Um, it, it, they are strange constructs. So the first time you see them, you say that but these people are crazy, okay? But uh, after a while, they start making sense in their own specific uh, uh, domain. Okay. Uh, okay, this, I see a new, another question from Federico. Are there any differences in creating an object with methods using a constructor function or using the closure as seen in the slide? Um, so let me maybe so that we, we can discuss by sharing some code. Share. So uh, you are say you are telling me that if I have some code like this, where's the chat? Whenever you share something, the chat will disappear. I need to. Okay. So your question is. Uh, Okay. Okay. Okay, it's, um, sorry, I, I have enabled the uh, linter that will tell me uh, warnings about the, uh, okay, let's forget about this. Um, okay. So you are defining an object like this, uh, function, okay, like this, return this point dot A. Okay, so uh, in, this, in this way, you are creating a, um, a function that will return an object. So for example, I can create a, a, an object uh, A1, 
as a new a3 with value 3. And so uh, a1 dot get a should return me the number 3 that it just uh, uh, created, right? Sorry, now I want to run this one. I had when uh, in the run. Okay, so uh, when you start doing complex things, VS Code uh, will insist in uh, defining uh, launch JS uh, and uh, define the launch configuration. So like, let's define one for launching this one. So I can create a new configuration for running this example that it calls constructor. So VS Code has a, keeps a, a file that we call launch.json where it will uh, put all the uh, launch configuration. So all the if you have a folder with many files, it will tell you, it will tell the browser, the, sorry, the node, uh, which kind, which file you should run first, okay? And so you can have more than once, but you need to configure them into this uh, configuration array. And you can also give it launch constructor. JS, okay. And once you have it, you should be able to run, where is that? Uh, Sorry, yeah, sorry. Okay, in the run, sorry, in the run, in the run tab, run and debug here. So I define the configuration because there are already one defined. And then from the run tab, you can decide which configuration to run. Okay, right now, so we are running. And there is an error. A1 is not defined, of course. Control F5, three, okay? So what you got? The alternative that you mentioned was uh, uh, using the closure as seen in the slides. So in the case, uh, you're using an object, if I remember what you mean. So uh, I can define a new object, A2, or, or a function returning an object uh, with closure. So what uh, you just, can, just can you point me with to which example you're referring in the slides that we can get the same example? Uh, so imagine that you're saying slide number number 41 using closures to emulate objects, where you define a a, um, a, a function that returns an object. Okay, so in that case. Uh, we would define a function, let's say b, with the parameter a, and this function will uh, define internally some variables, some internal variables. So let uh, uh, my a is equal to a. We initialize it when we find it. And then we return an object that we, we may use to access that uh, um, that variable. Okay. So uh, we return some methods that an object contains some methods that will uh, enable me to manipulate this variable. So in particular, it may be a get a method that will be a function that returns uh, the current value of the closure. So let's write it in an array, in an arrow function like this. Sorry. So it's the shortcut format uh, of the, um, okay, it's, uh, the linter that's really annoying in this case. So. Um, I can return it in this way. 
So in this case, I can call it in a, in a very similar way. Sorry, let me go down. Uh, we can call it in a very similar way. So const uh, b1 uh, is a new b of value four, for example. And uh, right away, we can see the value dot log console console dot log b1 dot get a. Uh, sorry. Parentheses, and we sh it should print four, hmm? and it does luckily enough. Um, <coughs> is there so there are two different ways of obtaining more or less the same result? Is there any difference? Well, what we can do is, for example, to have a look in the debugger. So let's start and debug this code so that we can inspect uh, these two objects. So we created one object A1 using the constructor syntax and the constructor function, and a method B1 using an, uh, a function with a closure, okay? Uh, so if we see in the variables tab here, I'm trying to make it larger. Uh, how can we? Okay, let's call up this, okay. So we have A1, which is an object with a, a A field, an A property, and a get A property that is a function, A1. B1 is an object uh, with a get A method and nothing more. So the difference that we see is that there are two small differences. One is the uh, B1 is called object and the A1 is called A. So in a way, um, with a constructor function, we remember, is not a, a real thing that you can say in JavaScript, that we remember the, the constructor name. We remember the class or, it's, they're not real classes, but we, we remember that this object was an A object, was created by A. So it's not any object, but it's an object with the characteristics uh, of an A object. Of course, uh, after, just after creation, we could modify it and translate it into something else. But you see that the type of this object, the debugger, remember there's an A, which is the name of the constructor we created it. And in the other case, uh, it's just an object, a generic object. Of course, we are creating an object like that with the, uh, with, sorry, with this code, so, with this code here. This code will just create an object, an anonymous object like any other object. The other difference is that, of course, we have the get a function that uh, does whatever it does. And on, the, on B1, we have the get a function. Well, this is an arrow and the other is an expression, but it doesn't change the, the, the matter. The, the other difference, you see that A is accessible here, while A is B, a hidden in B. So when we are returning, an object uh, with a closure, the only really accessible field from the outside are these ones, get a. And so the my a variable is not visible from the outside. You cannot access that from here. No. Why? In the object a1, uh, the created object has two properties. One is property a, and one is property get a. Just forget about the function, about everything. From the syntax point of view, you see that you are attaching an attribute a and an attribute get a to the object that has been created. And so this, uh, in this case, the property a can be accessed you, like, like the property get a. So nothing forbids me from doing a uh, console.log of a1 dot a i'm directly accessing the property and there's nothing better about that it will print the value of the property three three and four so i'm not say if my uh, goal was of hiding uh, internal variables and only providing access methods uh, the closure is uh, 
safer, if I can say that. In the other case, I'm creating an object with all the fields available. That's, that's, uh, that's one of the differences. Uh, usually, you know, there's not much encapsulation in the mind of the JavaScript designer. So creating an object means I create an object with uh, seven properties, all of them can be used. Okay. Uh, we, we didn't see the access properties that are a way of getting, of creating automatically getter and setters. There's another part of the syntax that we didn't, uh, they did, we decided to, uh, not to present them that uh, uh, at the moment. But uh, in the mind of a JavaScript designer, I'm creating an object, so I'm not making any difference between private and public uh, properties, uh, between uh, variable properties and, um, and methods, so function properties. And so what, what you get is a really uh, an object with all the properties available. Some of them are callable. Some of them can be are, are values. In the other case, you are more control because you are creating your own object with a custom control of what is visible outside and what is only accessible through a closure, and so it's not dif uh, directly visible from the outside. So it's a thin difference, but uh, that could be one of the differences. Okay. Any other questions? It's a bit scary because the, the syntax of JavaScript is so simple, but then its behavior is uh, so complex depending on the details of how you create things. So it takes a while. Uh, the variable in the second case is protected. Uh, well, protected is not uh, doesn't have any meaning in um, in uh, in JavaScript, but uh, we could say yes. So there is no no easy way of getting to the reference my a uh, by through the object B one that we constructed. So uh, I didn't say there is no way. I just say that there's no easy way, no direct way. Of course, you can always get to the object because uh, JavaScript has full uh, introspection features. So you can uh, enter into the get a method and then see its, its scope and then get to the variable. Okay, you, <laughs> you need to, 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 to dig a bit, a, a bit deeper, but you, you could do that. But uh, let's say it's a way of, uh, so it's not a foolproof protection. It's not a really something really hidden. You can go, you can get it through through the to the to the reflection methods over the method get a, but it's not directly available. It's not directly visible. So yes, we are somewhat hiding for protecting it from programming errors. Okay, we are not really protecting it if somebody wants really to have the look at that. And malicious code can can of course access that. Um, uh, okay, Angelica makes a nice question that, uh, um, okay, so I will skip to get time, I will come to it later because just we continue um, on this topic. Uh, Angelica said, but uh, could we modify that to, let's say, hide uh, this uh, variable just by returning like this? Oh, sorry, maybe we make another function. Let's call it C. Hmm? C. And uh, you don't declare a property and you just declare a closure. Uh, so declaring get A, see, yes, it's, a, it's a, a narrow function that return A.
Okay. So um, yeah. Yes, it can be done. Uh, so it's uh, you are we are defining a narrow function that will close over this parameter, so over the parameter of the function. So it will uh, remember the reference to the function parameter a, and uh, uh, let's let's check it if it's working. So let's call it c1 by calling c with value five. And say if C, what c one dot get a will give us, it should give us five. No, what's wrong with that? Uh, can I say property a or undefined? Ah, sorry, new. As you saw, I I call the constructor function without the new keyword, and so I get the the error that uh, this is undefined. You don't have any object to add an attribute to because it's a constructor function should it must be called with new okay okay and it's five and in this case let's move the breakpoint here and run in debug mode sorry And we may see that our object C1 only has the get a property. Yes, so it's a way of doing that. But it works only because uh, we want to protect uh, a variable which is exactly the parameter of the function. Uh, maybe we could have just uh, a local variable, let. So, and not a property. Let. Uh, my a equal to a, and then we close over my a, like we did in the other case. So it should behave in the same way. Uh, and if we step one forward, it will print a five. But we are getting closer with the, to the closure method. So actually, we are using a closure inside the constructor. Yes, we can combine them as you want. Um, if the return value is an extra an array, I cannot say that get guarantees that I will not modify it from the outside. This is always true. Yes, you can never protect a, a complex data structure. Um, do you remember the first slide I shown in the with the JavaScript objects? The first slide I shown was. Uh, uh forget about java objects so uh, we have a lot of background uh, in uh, um, stressing the importance of protection of encapsulation of uh, safe access to methods and so on and so the first time you know you have the instinct of time trying to protect to hide everything and to find mechanism to replicate uh, the way in which, in which you were programming in java replicating that in javascript okay don't fight it. Okay? Just embrace it. Uh, I don't know if uh, if you uh, ever known uh, Python. It more or less has the same philosophy. Okay, uh, there is no notion of protection or hiding when you're creating objects in Python. So uh, just don't do that. If you, you know, there are conventions. Say, okay, if you, if I put an underscore to a property, then the programmer should not be supposed to use it. But there's no real strong protection for that. Um, so yes, the, uh, it, of course, it depends on what we are doing. Now, just don't try to create a, a more complex structures than we need just for replicating a model of objects that you have in mind that will not apply very easily to uh, to js okay uh, let's use js objects as they are containers of values and then the programmer can use them values methods and so on uh, uh, more freely if you really want to hide something we will maybe uh, say use this construction function or um, classes that are good at, at uh, hiding some some details uh, or modules and so on 
which are more more complex than we need in many cases so the mechanisms there is good to understand them uh, how they work and I, th I think that the debugger and the inspector will help us really to understand what's happening this proto field is something that we also need to learn one day okay uh, which is the the way javascript is doing uh, something similar to inheritance but it's not really inheritance so again it's uh, something that you, you, we seem to be familiar with but we are not because it, it has a different mechanism uh, but in any case, the, the observation of Ricardo uh, holds. So uh, whenever you have a, a complex data structure, so a reference to an object that contains other objects, uh, of course, the, uh, the object will not, uh, the content of the object will never be protected enough. Okay, there, it's, not, it's not possible, basically. Okay. Unless you wrap the object, so you don't use an array, use another data structure that gives only, read-only access to the methods. But then you have to create your own get method, your own filter, your own sort method by working on this uh, encapsulated data structure. Is it worthwhile? Mm, usually not. Okay. Uh, so it, it takes more discipline about uh, the user of the library, I say, to avoid doing strange things with your objects, but it's, uh, it's in their own interest, basically. Okay. So maybe I can get back to the question about the dates. Uh, uh, do we have to compare dates using the get time methods or there are other ways? Uh, well, get time is an easy method because it will return you a number. So let me share that slide. Uh, days, 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 says here. Okay, so I share this. Share. Uh, this slide no yeah okay so in this slide we saw that one way of comparing two dates hmm, is uh, uh, using get time uh, to get the milliseconds corresponding to either of them and then making called computer the difference so these are and say an easy way of doing the comparison because it will get you uh, two numbers two integers to compare uh, just be careful that get time uh, uh, there's li really a lot of confusion here because uh, we have a date object that is called date but it really contains date and time and we have a get time method that gives you a number that uh, con encoded again both date and time so the names here are, are really bad they copy those names from the java.util uh, package which was equally bad hmm? So uh, don't get me started in, the, in commenting the, the implementation of this method. But this is a, a, an easy way if you are if you know what you're doing. So you are comparing times down to the millisecond. If you don't need to compare them down to the millisecond only to the day, you need to kill all the timing variables uh, uh, to the objects before comparing, before doing the get time. The alternative would be to do a comparison field by field. So you can have a date, you can get the day, get year, uh, get month, and so on. And can comp you, you may compare, if you only co want to compare the date, you can say that whether uh, the year gets year is equal to get year, uh, and uh, get month is equal to get month, and uh, get uh, uh, is not uh, day, because this is the day of the week, uh, but... Uh, get date probably yes get date uh, is equal to the get date of the other object so you can compare the three uh, ingredients of the of the data year month and day and uh, so you are unpacking the date into its components and then doing the comparisons uh, in that case you can decide which fields you want to compare okay in the other case you are just converting to a number and uh, and um, and comparing the numbers so there are always many ways of doing the same thing. Um, okay. So um, interesting question about the timeout. Um, you're saying, let me open the, oh, sorry, the code again. Uh, so if you're 
I'll uh, reshare again the screen. Okay. So what you're saying is, let's call it timeout .js. What you're saying is that why is isn't this working? And let me pick the chat again. Okay. You're strict and set them out. Uh, and uh, you have a while through that loops forever. And you say, okay, if I run this, uh, the hello will never be printed. Yes. Uh, let's, let us see why. So uh, we need to configure another launch configuration for a timeout.js. Okay, and let's run it. And as you say, sorry, launch timeout. The program does not terminate, will still run, of course, because we have the while true, and, but this uh, will never uh, be printed. Uh, let's do another, let's try to comment this out. And let's run it again. And you see that it will come out. The program will not terminate immediately. So if you comment this one, the program will not terminate immediately. I run it again. Let's have a look. It will start, wait, and then print. Because the program knows that there are some still pending timeouts, and so the program will not terminate until all the timeouts are expired. Okay, so it will wait. Uh, so the timeout is working. Okay, so why isn't it working uh, in this uh, in this loop? Uh, the reason is very. Uh, easy because uh, uh, JavaScript is a single threaded. We only have a single threaded for everything. So this timeout will not run in a separate thread in real parallel. Uh, this timeout will be, uh, there is a sort of an, in an event queue that will encode that, that encodes all the pending events, all the pending asynchronous event, asynchronous, synchronous action. Um, and so it will execute them when the main thread is idle. So this is the single uh, uh, sort of, a, I'm putting quotes around asynchronous and around main thread because there is only one thread. So the timeouts are not really asynchronous. It's an, uh, uh, something that is, will be made, there's both in the browser and in Node.js, uh, all the programs run inside an, an event loop. No? If you want to know, to know more, just look for the, event loop in, in Node.js or in, or in the browser. The this is the mechanism where all the new, the future events are scheduled to be executed in the future. But they just are uh, queued in a, in, a, in a FIFO queue, you don't know, so in a priority queue, depending on the time in which they will be executed. And, uh, uh, but while the program is running, doing something actively, that queue will uh, not be uh, read. They will not be asynchronously read or, or processed. They will just stay there. When the main program is idle, then uh, the, the interpreter, the runtime environment, uh, be, uh, just say, okay, I have nothing to do in the main thread, which is not really a thread because as we said there's only one thread for everything, but the simulation of the main thread, um, you can uh, um, 
uh, well, how to say, um, there's nothing to do, so I will pick the next event from the uh, from the from the queue of future events, uh, and so we can uh, uh, let's say uh, if the if the time for the new event is already come, then we can execute that callback and then return to to idle again. Uh, basically, we are uh, the kind of exercises we are doing right now are a bit of uh, artificial because uh, JavaScript is thought mainly for working on a, a reactive asynchronous environment. So we have a, a main program which uh, after initialization does nothing, only waits for external events, uh, user clicks and new data from the server and so on. So the main thread is usually after initialization, as we said, is usually idle most of the time. And it's only processing asynchronous events that are not really synchronous, but are queued into a single thread. Uh, is there a way to force an idle inside the while? Yes, I don't remember if it's called wait or yield or something like that. Uh, I don't remember. I should look if you can wait a second. Uh, The, the, the method name. Um, okay, so come on. Okay, um, so to answer the way, if there is a way to force uh, an idle inside the while, uh, um, there is not um, a, a simple method to say to release the thread uh, to, to, the, to the event loop. Uh, so there is not a single function. There is a mechanism that will uh, use the uh, async await constructs. Uh, um, so you can just say wait until that happens. Uh, but uh, it's something that we don't have the syntax right now for for understanding that we'll see that in the, in the next class when we called about uh, as, async uh, await uh, and promises uh, which are the construct to make this uh, um, say easier to to handle um, the, the the issue is that uh, uh, timeouts and events are the low level mechanism on top of that there are easier mechanisms to be to be uh, able to handle with all of that okay so there's no uh, yield or in java we had a thread dot sleep method uh, because there is no really real thread to do that we can simulate that with, with promises and with the with the await await is a new keyword and then we'll see next week so there is a way but uh, not right not not today <laughs> In general, if you are just trying to waste time here, I'm just trying to, uh, as we say, we, you don't need to do that. Uh, so uh, never lose C CPU times uh, on uh, on JavaScript on an interpreter language. Uh, but you're maybe you're saying, okay, but yeah, I have the main program that has nothing to do. Okay, don't do anything. Or maybe just set an interval where the main program will do something every maybe two seconds, five seconds. Uh, and so, uh, for example, I can, the main program will do nothing, and but I want still to have the control. So like, like if, if I close the program like this, only the scheduled event will take place. But if I want to keep a control on the main program, I could also maybe set an interval, so a periodic uh, action to do, just to say, okay, I'm still alive, okay? So for example, 
uh, like you say, a handler is uh, maybe uh, console.log a dot. and every every half a second and so we have the main program that is doing something in this case just logging at, uh, an asterisk here uh, twice a second and we still run uh, forever but from one execution to another so we we'll still run we we'll still do stuff so if we need to do something continuously we can do that but uh, uh, from one execution to the other we release the control so that uh, uh, the environment can process uh, the the queue so this is another way so it's not the the right question will not be uh, how to um, let's say force an idle inside the main thread is the wrong version the right version thinking asynchronously is uh, uh, we should n have nothing to do in the main thread and everything should be scheduled uh, in a synchronous uh, uh, actions, in a synchronous callbacks. Is it possible to think things in the same line with console.log? Probably yes. Uh, just imagine that the console.log is just a, a, um, a debugging tool. So in, no, normally uh, a JavaScript application will uh, um, modify the content of the page and the log is just for uh, for so uh, so just for the bank let me check I'm checking the documentation in, in the second screen so wait a second just I think there's a second parameter to do that but I'm not so sure But again, we'll try to move away from the console as soon as possible so that we can start working in the browser. Uh, okay, my internet connection is not responding. A log uh, substitution. Well, not in J, it seems that there's no way in general, but depending on the implementation. So the the, the, um, the Chrome console has some special methods uh, uh, different from the uh, the node console. So I wouldn't rely, rely on them, on, on those uh, on on those ways, on those methods. So for the moment, uh, let's, let's consider it not to be a problem, okay? So the real, if you want to do something on the same line, the, uh, we will do that in the browser and we will just modify the text property of an element where we add some elements and so on. Uh, it's not a real print, it's just a debug uh, statement. Uh, okay, uh, then I have a question on array sorting. I have another object with a description field, which is a string and written the base sort in this way. Okay. But I call it two times, I get by the array in two different orders, one ascending and the other in descending order. Why does this happen? So actually what you are saying, I copy the, the question here to the screen so that you, uh, okay, so that it gets recorded. So this is a way, a correct way of defining a short callback. So uh, giving two elements, uh, I, re I respond with one or minus one, whether they are increasing or decreasing um, when i call it two times uh, it will get back the array in two different orders one descending and the other in descending order so if you, if you sort the same array twice you get different results i find it difficult to believe uh, sort I, uh, So first of all, this this uh, this function is a bit of a uh, incomplete because it doesn't take into account the case where the two descriptions are uh, these two descriptions are equal. 
So there should also be a case when you return zero, okay? Um, and this doesn't. In our specific example, probably you will have no duplicate task, no task with the same description, so there will not be a case. But in this case, you are saying that, hey, no, it should be in ascending order. So uh, maybe you could share uh, the, the, the complete program to try, to, to try, because just from this statement, I cannot see anything that can be wrong. So let me just do a quick try. So a task array can be something that you have the description, which is uh, A, B, C, and then a description. Let's do it minimal, right? Which is a D, E, F. Maybe another one description, which is a uh, M and O, and another description here. Which is a an X, Y, Z. OK. Hello. So let's save it with a name. Let's comment everything out here. Then you write it, uh, but let, let's console.log task array. Then we sort it with your method. Reprint it again, resort it, and print it again a third time. This should do the trick. And uh, define this config launch from configuration again for sorting. Save. Sorting. Wow. Mm -hmm. Tasks. Hey. Okay, I, I can seem to have a consistent naming of these variables. Let's get just get it running and then we'll see it in the browser, in the debugger, okay? Okay, of course it's printing four objects. We don't have a way to print them directly. So we can stop the debugger here and run in debug mode. So the first one is uh, in this order, okay? Then we step, we sort it, and then it's sorted in alphabetical order. So you see that it's the same task array that has been modified in place. So we're printing it, resort it, and it will not change. So I don't see, I, I cannot repeat this behavior. I saw that you download the you um, shared one file. So let's uh, uh, save it and try to share it to everybody. Okay, this PC. Come on. Okay. And 
and uh, where was it saved? Just a second, I too many open stuff here. Um, okay, this one. So this is your code, and uh, it's a, it's a, yes, yes, but it's a complete program. So I don't want to correct uh, tomorrow's labs. It was just uh, uh, where uh, so all the tasks in order is, is case four. It seems the it seems correct, so it's in it's the same code. Task array, okay. So I know I don't see any reason why it should uh, uh, work uh, in in uh, strangely. So maybe I keep this code and can I can have a look uh, uh, offline. I try to debug it off, offline. Uh, but it's maybe something that you can. Uh, uh, it, the um, what I would ask you is try if you try to uh, reproduce the the uh, this behavior with a simpler program. So always try to have a, a minimum working example where the bug appears. Okay, and try to understand whether it's a, in a, an issue of a, also with the debugger. Uh, is the array in the wrong order or is it just printed in a strange order? Um, so I will keep this exercise and have a look at it uh, uh, later on. But I don't see anything wrong with, this, with the approach. So there'll be something, yeah, uh, something uh, uh, that, that we don't see at the first sight. So it needs more careful debugging. It's not just the sorting instruction. That is correct. There's something else working on. Uh, the question was, why uh, uh, can I write uh, a dot desk minus b dot desk? So uh, one suggestion was uh, was this one: uh, use the subtraction operation uh, instead of this uh, ternary operator. Well, uh, it would be nice, uh, but it, only if there were number. If you have a uh, um, so you can subtract numbers, so the greater one will give a positive result and the uh, smaller one will give negative, uh, negative results and, and so on, but uh, uh, only if they are number. For strings, uh, it's not possible. So you cannot do the subtraction of strings, okay? So there is no, there is no the, the easy solution. Uh, no, 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 it, uh, no, it doesn't subtract a uh, SQL, code. It doesn't do that. There is a comparison method in the strings, by the way. I don't tell you how it's called because you can discover it. If you look at the documentation of the string object, you see that among the many methods, uh, there is one for doing comparison. So the, the right solution would be to delegate to the comparison method for strings, uh, which is there, which is defined in the library. I won't tell you how it's called, uh, uh, but you can find it very easily. If you go to the, to the MDN uh, on the string page where you list all the methods, uh, and then you can use that method instead of making that your own. Okay, well, so we should always, my general suggestion is always first try to look whether the library already has the solution for you. If not, you can build it yourself. But in many cases, you will find that uh, since your problem will not be the first one, a lot of other people will have it. I uh, will have had it in the past, and so there will be already a, a good method uh, uh, for doing that. And the name of the method. You, you will find that uh, it's also, uh, we also tell you that ASCII is not the real solution. Mm -hmm. there's, there's something more complex. Remember that uh, JavaScript works in Unicode. So uh, the comparison is uh, it's a bit more complex. But anyway, 
uh, whether you can rely with the greater than operator or with the uh, say comparison method between, between strings, uh, uh, the, the approach is the correct one. Okay, so uh, I think that we are a bit over time. Uh, it's not a real problem for, for us because we are doing everything asynchronously, also in JavaScript and also in the lectures. But uh, if there are uh, no further problems or questions, maybe we could uh, reschedule the meeting for tomorrow morning where we, you will work with uh, uh, Alberto and Luigi for, on, the, on the lab topics. And uh, always remember that uh, we created a Slack group, so every question is welcome also there. Uh, so we'll try to uh, to respond also there. And uh, we'll be having also a look at this uh, strange sorting problem uh, that Lorenzo uh, submitted to us. OK. So. Thanks for everything today, and we'll meet uh, next week, uh, the same day, same hour, same um, medium. Always check uh, for new slides and new material on the uh, on the course web page, and uh, we are, where we also you find also the links uh, for Zoom and so on. Um, and check the the Slack group for the announcement of new material and so on. So, thanks to everybody, and see you next time. Bye bye.